All right. Uh, welcome everyone to our Customer Insights webinar session of December. Um, let's wait for a little while for people to join online, but maybe you can already let me know in the chat that the audio is okay, that you are hearing me. Okay. At least someone hears me, so <laughs> audio is okay. Thank you. Looks that everything is working well. I'll give it just a just a little while more to see that people come online. Also, for everyone to know, um, this webinar, like the previous ones as well, will be recorded. Uh, we will share this link after the session. We will send it um, via email to everyone, so you can also watch it uh, afterwards or share it to your colleagues. All right. I guess we can get started. So uh, today we have Case Evolve Consultancy and we have Nigel Davies from, from Evolve Consultancy to, uh, to present uh, his experiences. I'm your host. Uh, I'm Rina, Product Marketing Manager at Solibri. Tried to make some season's greetings wipe in my picture, but there's still no slow snow in, in southern Finland, so I don't know how it turned out. But anyways, I hope uh, uh, you can get the spirit at least. <laughs> uh, about today's presentation. So Nigel is sharing his experiences from two projects, uh, due to different types of uh, projects uh, on, on assuring quality uh, with Solibri. And, uh, and sharing something about the importance of, of the model data and, and how it needs to match the requirements of, of the client or, or customers. So uh, it's gonna be a really interesting presentation again. Um, also, we will have in the end of, of this session, uh, we will have some time for, for your questions. Uh, at any point during the presentation or during the, this webinar, you can send your questions to the chat or the question box uh, in the go to webinar pa panel and uh, <clears throat> we will then go them through uh, after Nigel's presentation. Uh, we also have Lauri Luoma, uh, our, our um, customer success manager in Solibri. He's also online to answer if you have any Solibri related questions. So you can maybe also state when you send your question if, if it's for Nigel or is it, is it for Solibri so we know, know who we ask it from. Uh, now, before we start the presentation, uh, we'd like to run a quick poll. Um, this time we are asking you about checking BIM model data. So let me launch the poll. Here we go. So we're interested to hear uh, about how you you check your uh, BIM models uh, and the data? Do you check them? Do you check the data at all or or no? I'm gonna wait a few seconds more to give you time to reply. I'm not gonna say minutes because I think it's not gonna take minutes. <laughs> more more like seconds. <clears throat> There are some answers coming in. Just a couple seconds more. Now it looks like the majority has given their vote, so I'm going to close the poll now. Thank you. And let me share. Uh, the results. So uh, almost half replied that you um, are checking the data, but it's uh, always different depending on a project. And then third of you are saying that you are checking the data based on a BIM manual or, or such. But there are also some people who don't don't check. So maybe you get new ideas from from. Uh, Nigel's session today on, on this. 
But yeah, now without further ado, I will hand it over to Nigel. Let me give you, Nigel, the screen so you can share it. Excellent. Thank you, Ina. Okay, you should be able to see the screen now. Yes, and looks okay welcome. here. Please. Thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, everybody, for coming um, to listen to this talk about um, assuring quality. Um, I'm sorry if, uh, if you're looking at the camera, the light is on behind and it's, it's a bit kind of bright down on the camera, but it's gone really dark here in the last 10 minutes. Um, we've got a storm coming over, so I do apologise. Anyway, you don't need to look at me. The screen is far more interesting. Um, so, firstly, thank you very much for the introduction. I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. I've been working in, originally in structural engineering is where I come from. Um, I've been working in the industry now for over 25 years. Um, work mainly with um, in the engineering and architecture fields, um, both for designers, contractors and clients. Um, and one of one of our specialties here at um, Evolve Consultancy is um, information exchange and uh, assurance of data on projects. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, myself, um, I was originally involved in the UK's PAS 1192, which you may be aware of, the uh, the document that was launched back in 2016, 2015. Um, to address the UK government mandate here for delivering BIM in projects. Um, and now I'm um, I'm helping with the UK BIM Alliance, uh, dealing with guidance on the, the new ISO 19650 documentation. Um, and I also help run the communities here, which are groups of um, regional and um, team or focus based uh, groups helping to disseminate the, the BIM message here across the UK. Um, one of the important things that we do, um, not us personally, but as an industry, is um, ensuring that buildings are built correctly. And buildings could be easy, they could be simple, but they can be complex. Even simple buildings can have complex areas. And all of us, I'm sure, judging by those poll results, understand the need for effective coordination on a building. Um, we're not just talking here about, you know, complex areas of services, although that's very important. Um, coordination across a whole project is always um, critical, especially we find between the, the interfaces, um, structure and services being one of the main ones, and then actually the envelope and structures. Um, clash detection over the last few years has really um, raised its head and become a really important part of coordination. There is a difference. Clash detection alone is not coordination. Clash detection is a way of identifying the issues. Coordination is the way of resolving them and making sure the building is actually completed correctly. But <clears throat> clash detection is just one part of quality. Um, quality extends far further than that. And one of the key principles to make sure that quality is, um, is as high as it can be on a project, information requirements need to be understood. They need to be clearly defined and they need to be defined clearly and concisely. More often than not, if you're asking for the wrong thing, you will get the wrong thing. You may be thinking you're asking for the right thing, but people may not interpret your needs correctly. So um, it's it's really important to to look for what we call consistency and correctness in every aspect of information requirements across a project. That's not just in the delivery. It's not just in the quality assurance of that, but it's also in the definition of the information requirements right at the start of the project, throughout the project, to handover and then operations and maintenance. Um, it's, it's things, not just are elements in the correct place, but are elements the correct size? Just as importantly, are there the correct number of elements? All these kind of things come together to make a consistent and correct project. Um, to do that, the way we recommend and we work with our clients to achieve is working to consistent schemas. And by that, what I mean is it's, um, 
structuring your data requirements in a consistent manner. Um, we're working in the construction industry, as I'll go into later, and things aren't always as ideal as we'd like, but we can always use the tools available to us and um, plan for those areas where our experience shows us consistency isn't going to be consistent. Um, the idea of working to consistent schemas is something that comes up again and again in our works, both at specification and delivery, as I've said. And, and one of those things, um, to put it into context, is why we are handing over a project. Um, as a designer, yes, you're thinking about certain things in a project, um, but this, this slide really sums up for the owner operator what this information is all about. It's about understanding the three items um, that actually are described as um, what rooms and equipment are delivered in a building. What do I have? Um, and where does somebody go to fix that? How do they know where that equipment is and how do they know how to access it? And in terms of maintaining it, how and when are, if, where, how and when is equipment operated and maintained? Um, people are talking a lot these days about preemptive maintenance and making sure that, you know, items are working at their optimal state before they break down. And without consistent and correct data, there is no way of achieving that easily. Sure, things can be done, but th this data is the is the, the key, I nearly said golden thread then, it, but it is to um, a successful project delivery. Now, in terms of the UK, um, I should say a lot of us in the world are now um, aware of ISO 19650. Um, it is an international standard which is developed from the 1192 series here in the UK, and it's been taken a little bit further. In the UK, we have a national annex at the end. And that while it's not quite a mandate, it is, um, it's an important aspect of the way that information is, is realized here in the UK. <coughs> and as it says here, um, unless specified to the contrary, um, information models exchanged with the appointing party, i.e. delivered, should include geometric information and or in proprietary formats or open data formats. So the model format that you use to create things or open data formats. Um, Non-geometrical information should also be in open data formats. And it goes further here to say that it should be structured in accordance with BS 1192 part four in the process of being developed into ISO 19650 part four, which is the UK implementation of COBE. And if you're not familiar with COBE, don't worry, I'll go through that in a little bit of detail later on. And then finally, documentation in open data formats. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the ISO standards behind those, but that's just important as kind of a, a framework to why we do what we do. Um, open data formats are, are key in my eyes to moving forward. But let me just give you a quick illustration of what that means and why in terms of authoring information models and the end result of um, facilities management. So here's a quick slide that shows a, a series of different tools. Now, in certain situations, um, the, there may be direct links, certain file formats that go directly between the authoring tools and the FM tools. And that's absolutely fantastic if there is, that there's never going to be a more robust way of transferring data than a direct proprietary format designed specifically for that purpose. But that's not the case with all software. Um, certain software can't talk directly to other platforms. So in those instances, there's often a case where you have to go through another proprietary format to get your information in to another system. Um, in, terms, in terms of then looking at the industry as a whole, that leads to a, a number of challenges, not least of which is having access to the to the object data behind the formats to be able to make sure that the conversions can be done correctly. But also there are in numerous pieces of software out there that are being used for specific reasons. They all have to be able to talk to each other using specific formats. So that's a, a multi-choice result. Open data formats take that out of the equation. In terms of let's just talk geometry and using IFC as an open data format, that bridges the gap 
between disparate pieces of software. So I could be working in um, one platform and through IFC, I can take that geometry directly into a platform. And the difference here is it only needs to support this one open data platform. If all products support it, all products can talk to each other. So that goes further and it becomes that no matter which platform you're using or which FM system you have to deliver to, you can get to it through these open data formats. Um, I will just say before I move on here that it's not all about handover. One of the um, one of the challenges that gets raised to us every time we talk about Kobe on a project is, well, Kobe is just for handover. Kobe is just for FM. Um, IFC isn't important throughout the design phase of a project. Those kind of arguments that are sometimes a little bit naive. But here's a quick slide that actually shows that this data is there or these open data formats are there to help answer questions throughout a project. The questions that we've answered um, since time immemorial when projects are actually developed, designed and delivered, we need to understand at different stages of the project exactly what the information is being used for and how it's being used to answer specific questions. So in terms of here, at stage one, we're talking about the requirements and constraints of the project. How much is it going to cost? What is the environmental information that we've got and how is that going to affect the intended performance of the building? Through stages three, when we're understanding about the tender, the actual specific costs, the functionality of the room of, of the building and what each room is going to contain in it, which goes through um, technical design four and construction five to come out at the end. Uh, yes, it is an important part, the operations and maintenance, and that's where um, we start to see ratios of a pound in design is, is 10 pounds in construction, which equals 100 pounds saved in operations and maintenance. Without a doubt, that the 50 years that a building may be occupied is a big proportion of this design, but it's not the only criteria. Without these stages of the early stage of the project and effective and, and um, efficient use of data through those stages, operations and maintenance won't be as effective as it can be. And in terms of the way we work, to get this bridge of open data formats, the solution for us is to use Celebri. <coughs> that allows us to step away from the specification of certain file formats or certain software to be used on a project and allow the delivery teams to use the software that is best suited for their needs. Um, I'm now gonna go on and actually get into the case study side of this presentation. Um, I'm going to be talking about two projects that, um, as Rena introduced earlier, are totally different in complexity and scope. And through this, I'm actually going to be going into Celebri and giving you some live crossed fingers, live explanations of how this is done and show you it in, in practice on another model. So here's the two projects that we're talking about. Um, the first one is a research uh, centre, archaeological research centre, ARC, for the British Museum. Um, it's about 16,000 metres squared. It's a storage and research facility um, just outside of Red. Well, it's actually in Shinfield, which is just outside of Reading. Um, if you're familiar with the UK at all, it's just off the Reading junction of the M4. And um, it's around a 30 million project. Um, it's, it's basically moving a, a series of... Um, historical collections from another building the British Museum own, which is due to be closed in 2023, Blythe House. Um, and it's bringing it in there um, into a specialized research center, um, not open to the public, but um, in conjunction with Reading University for study and research and review of these archeological collections. On the other side of the scope, um, another project we're involved with is the Tideway Tunnels in London, which um, is, a, a major infrastructure project to replace the Victorian sewer systems across the whole of London. Um, to give you some idea of the, con the, the concept of this job, um, back in 1858, um, when the original sewer system was designed, London had a population of two million people. Um, Basil Jett, the engineer who designed it, actually had his um, had foresight to design this to a, support a population of around four or five million. Um, London is now at 9 million plus, so um, the, the sewer system is way beyond capacity. Um, and this project is to upgrade and update the sewer systems to be able to support um, the, the foreseeable future of sewage 
requirements in London. Um, it's actually a, a huge project, over 25 kilometres, divided up into 24 different work sites, actually between three major works contractors, um, the west portion, the central portion and the east portion, which are all being done by uh, joint ventures between major contractors to be able to deliver. Um, both projects um, are at different phases. Um, obviously, with the Tideway project on the right, the, the time frame is a, a lot greater than the one on the left. But both projects are now um, in construction. Um, there's been a few delays, particularly on the British Museum this year, due to the, um, the pandemic across the world. But um, they are both now um, deep into the construction phases. And that means that the data at this point is essential for both projects. So let's take a step back and look at, on both these projects, what was specified at the beginning. Um, and these are two excerpts from the, um, the information requirements on the projects. The one on the left, this has always been the British Museum Architectural uh, Archaeological Research Centre, and on the right, the Tideway project. But as you can see, both of them are specifying the delivery strategy needs to be in open data formats. Um, regardless of the proprietary formats used, both are asking for COBE, COBE, and both are asking for IFC, which allows this whole proprietary question to be taken out of the mix, and it also allows the quality assurance to know exactly what data it's going to be receiving. Um, the reason these were both specified on this project is because they are ISO standards. There was no client instruction on what software to use, but these published international standards actually allowed the teams to work to recognised requirements. And uh, if for those of you interested, there's the ISOs that actually back these up. Um, we don't know how the data is always going to be used in the future. And so by dealing this, um, dealing this open data format card, you know that you've got a strong hand that you can pass on to people should you need it. The data is always going to be there. The, 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 the data is always going to be interpretable. But why were they chosen? Apart from being international standards, it's not. that's not just the only reason. The reason being that there needs to be some kind of data validation on the projects. Um, collaborative delivery is important on, on both of them, obviously, with a lot of disciplines working together. Um, but it's on the British Museum project, achieving the asset information requirements is, is, is crucial. Um, as part of the longer term strategy, standardising on these open data formats means that it's the, the, the British Museum are able to standardise on input and output of asset information to and from facilities management partners. So they're not just specifying that COBE needs to be a delivery from the design team. They're also specifying that COBE needs to be an important part of the FM strategy moving forward so that the software and tools can interpret that data directly. On the Tideway side, um, this is a huge project, and as it says there on the screen, there are hundreds of individual checks that need to be um, performed on each deliverable. Um, much of that um, is it's not easily automatable um, in the native formats. Sure, there are tools available, um, the project's being delivered um, mainly on DGN format. Um, you can use the internal CAD standards checks in that software to, to identify whether things, whether the right layers are being used, for example. What you can't do is check the right information is on the right layer easily because it's a line, you know, it's, it's an, an, a, an object. Is it on the right layer? By using something like Celebri, and I'll go through the process we've done to do that, we can take that and we can start to automate the, the classification data to understand exactly what it is and is it classified correctly, layer being one form of classification. Both projects have got detailed quality assurance workflows. I don't want to spend too much time on this because um, it's a bit too much on the screen to go through, but basically it's, it's about trying to assure the data before it becomes um, at the point of rejection. What we're trying to do is work collaboratively with all the teams to make sure that they are building and helping them structure their data in the way that's required. So many times on projects we see we get to handover and um, there is a, there's a, 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 a scramble to get the data that the client was expecting put into the model at the end 
that's not an efficient way of working for anybody. The way this has to be done in our eyes is collaboratively from the start, making sure that people understand why and what data needs to be in there before it becomes um, critical. Now we do that through a series of quality assurance checks. And to us, as we start now to talk about how Salibri helps us deal with this, the classification system inside Salibri is, is absolute key to this. Um, as you can see on the screen there, the structures between the two, um, apart from the naming, they're, they're very, very similar. What we're doing is breaking down the required data that we need um, and grouping that, pulling it out of the model, grouping it so that we can always um, interrogate it as we need to. Now that means even if the data we're receiving isn't in consistent locations, um, you know, let's face it, um, we work with not necessarily on these projects. We work with a couple of projects where every time we receive an IFC, um, it's structured differently because a different person is exporting that IFC. They're forgetting to tick the certain boxes that they need to send things out. And either the data's missing altogether, or hopefully it's there, but it's not in the areas we were expecting. What the classification system in Salibre allows us to do is to build rules in that find that data and, and map it to the correct location so that instead of working directly from the data, we've restructured it into these classifications, which we can then use to interrogate the data so that we know at our end, it's always consistent and correct. Now, because of that, because we're dealing with a, a huge number of files, particularly on the right, and the data between the three main works contractors may be specifically in different locations, some of these classifications can get very, very large. But the point is, that's our problem. We do that, that's what we're employed to do on the project is to, is to structure this data in the ways that we can interpret it. Um, the fact they're large or small doesn't really come into it. Yes, sometimes it takes a little bit longer to run the assurance rules, but the point is this works and it works well. Once we've got the data structured in the way we can interrogate it efficiently and effectively, we can run these checks, we can sit back and we can wait for them to generate. And we always know we're going to get consistent um, results. It may not always be correct because a project is never correct until the final delivery, but it helps us to identify those where, where those issues are much easier. Now, here's an example of one of those classifications, um, and this is this is where we always start. This is in terms of um, anybody who's familiar with the classification system. I'll give you a demo on it later inside of Salibri. This is the the top level Kobe um, classification. It's the Kobe asset definition. We've taken it, we've edited it slightly, and what we've got by here, this, the screenshot here, is, is a default for the, um, for the requirements of Kobe. Now, when we talk about the requirements of Kobe, um, we go all the way back to the, the national BIM standards in the US, uh, the Kobe annex for that, where all these um, requirements are defined. They're, they're not fun reading by any stretch of the imagination. But there are, are certain things that we need to understand. And one of those is, is that there are typical IFC entities that would not exist in Kobe. You can see there that some of them are excluded. I'll go through these in, in demo later on to make it clear. But effectively, the way we work the classification is everything is the, we, we specify that everything is right at the bottom line, everything is included. And then above that, we specify those things that aren't. Um, they are excluded assets. And these are actually built, if you if you care about these things, from table 101 in Kobe, um, in the Kobe specification, which states the IFC entities that should be excluded from all Kobe sheets. Um, now that is important. The, the reason I say that, and I go into detail about this, is understanding what the client expects of maintainable assets is very important. Um, that needs to be defined right at the top level in the asset information requirements of the project. And to do that, here's how it's stated in both the projects. Um, on the left, it's based on a simple classification system that says this is what we expect as part of our maintenance um, um, requirements. And on the right, the, uh, the asset data dictionary that breaks every entity down on the project into um, hierarchical codes so that they can be understood. Actually on Tideway, it's not just maintainable assets, it's maintainable and inspectable. So that extends the scope quite um, a little bit more. But the important thing here is 
it's important for the client to understand what they expect to receive. Even if you're working to Kobe requirements, the client's requirements may not be precisely what Kobe says is a maintainable asset. And so it's important right at the start of the project to define that. Um, we define that and we start to get it into simple terms by taking, um, taking those requirements and building a responsibility matrix from that. On the left here, you'll see an excerpt from the British Museum's um, responsibility matrix. And if you're familiar with working with responsibility matrix, in the UK, it's one of my bugbears that they say that they say very little. What you tend to see is they, they're broken down. Yes, they're broken down into building elements, so wall coverings and finishes or doors or um, duct work. And, and then what they do is say at stage one, we require LOD one. At stage two, LOD two. Stage three, LOD three. It's it's pointless. We all know that we've got to deliver the right level of information for stage three. So why tell us? The important thing is, is not just who's responsible for the geom geometric information, but actually we break it down and we map the properties against the required pro um, deliverable as well. So you can see here, actually, um, there is certain data that in this case, the architect is responsible for, but at construction stage, there is information that they won't have or have available to them for the same entity. Um, and that is where it passes on to the contractor or the specialist subcontractor to start providing information about warranties, for example, that will actually be delivered to the client. So we break this down far further into the properties that are actually needed to be delivered as well on a project. On the right here is an example definition <coughs> of the asset requirements on the Tideway project. And what we've tried to do there is break down the the project documentation, the references it uses, the asset information specification, to map that to exactly where the IFC property will be and then which Cobre field that will be used in. So that everybody can understand what data is expected to be delivered. And more importantly, the asset information requirements need to specify why that data is required. It's not just a case of you'll deliver Kobe because it's an ISO standard. You'll deliver Kobe because we need to maintain this object. You'll deliver IFC because actually we've got automated checks that we need to run through to be able to identify whether the information is correct. If not, we're probably looking at 10, 15, 20 times longer to analyze the data and to validate it and to accept it. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, the first thing that we then do is run things through a series of, of checks. Once we've got the classifications built, we run through a series of checks and that can start to show us what information has passed these checks. Um, you know, in, in this example, a simple check of whether the component has got a type associated with it. Um, but all of those classifications are built for a reason because we are asking validation questions to be able to accept that information. In terms of, you know, in terms of the Tideway project there, um, there are certain requirements that we're checking there that the asset location tag has been properly completed and we can check that they are or they aren't on specific project on specific items. So I'm going to just take a moment here and go into Celebri. I always worry about live demos. They always tend to go wrong, but I'm trying to keep this simple. So this is actually a, a much simpler project. This is a training project that we use. It's falling water, um, if you recognize it. But it, it gives us the same principles. It doesn't matter to us what size a project is. It's the principles of analyzing and assuring the data that are important. So the first thing that we need to do on any project, we have got these, um, these checking rules broken down into stages. Clearly, there is a higher requirement of checking when you get to stage five and hand over stage six than there is at stage three. But as I said, we've tried to work collaboratively with the delivery team to make sure that they've got the information and it's building successfully throughout the project. So the first thing we need to do is we've got a lot of our rules stage based. I'm just I'm just going to go in here into well, let's go into stage four because that's what this demo is actually built around. Um, and what I'm going to do is just go into the Kobe extension. This is available. Um, it's a separate extension that needs to be downloaded and installed if you haven't got it. Um, but the important thing when you've got it is this one here, Kobe assets, that is the top level. This is the one that defines whether an element is excluded or included. And so if I just right click on that and I go to settings, here's the list I was showing you earlier. 
um, which takes any entity and assigns it to whether it's an excluded asset or an included asset. Come all the way down to the bottom. Anything that hasn't been excluded is then included. Now, on this project, actually, the second lineup is a good example of how it's been extended slightly. Um, we were finding that um, there were certain whole items, objects, that were sneaking through into the included assets. So we had to identify that actually they were all created with the name whole in them so that we can actually pick that up and say anything that includes whole in the name becomes part of excluded assets because nobody wants holes. They're not maintainable assets. Um, so that's a good example of how these have been customized. It's a very simple example. Um, as I said, that's built to the Kobe specification table 102, actually. It says here in my notes, I said 101 earlier, but um, they both relate to exclusions in Kobe. Um, the other example I actually want to give you then is how we build these to structure the data from multiple sources. And the component name is a good example of this. Um, actually, that's a terrible example. Do apologize. I mean, type name is the one I want, sorry. So I'm just going to go down to the type name field. That's better. So we have built this then. Um, this project's actually been delivered in Revit. That's why the application is Revit. Anything else is, is classified slightly differently. Um, but what we've done is gone through the elements that are being delivered in the IFC file. Um, and we've built various classifications to split those out into classified or not classified. Um, an example of that might be the furniture here. Um, furniture, actually covering is a better example, sorry. Covering here, um, we need to classify that differently if it's a floor covering or a wall covering because the maintenance requirements are different. So we've actually looked here and we split the covering down into two different classifications. One if it contains the name floor, one if it contains the name wall, and that classification is actually a find. The way this works in classifications is when you see equals six, what that is doing is applying the actual column six as the classification name. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Sorry, that one. Name. Floor and wall. We then hopefully have everything picked up particularly in this project, it's a nice, easy one, and they become classified. In reality, what we'll find is, is that our entity is slipping through into the unclassified list. Um, that is then when we need to start going back to the um, delivery team and saying, well, your model now has 15, 16, 15,000, depending on the size of the project, unclassified components, they're slipping through. What that means is, in terms of quality assurance, it may be that we just don't have the right information that we're working to. Um, in this project, for example, you can see we built in some, some custom columns here because, in this case, the building services team came back to us and said, actually, we've already got that data. It's, it's actually stored in this parameter. Is it okay that you use that? Yes, it's perfectly okay for you to tell us which parameter you use. That's what we're asking for, and that's why we've got the responsibility matrix. You tell us where that parameter is actually stored. We'll just define these classifications to pull it out so we can use it. Um, so that's one thing, a good example of how we work collaboratively to um, get the information in consistent classifications. Um, another example of something we'll do is actually we use an information takeoff to try and identify that everything is the correct IFC entity. So we built a very simple um, information takeoff here, IFC entities, and all that does, it lists all the component types. So very, very simple and quick. We can see that on this project now there are 10 beams, there are 444 members, but critically for us is that things that are supposed to be a correct entity don't slip through as a generic object, an IFC building element proxy. Um, because this is a test project, it's a training project, there is only one. And if I click on that, we can actually quickly identify what it is and we can work out whether it should be a different entity type. In this case, actually, it's a hazard symbol. And it's something that is excluded from Kobe. So in this case, we can go, nope, that one's perfectly okay. It can remain as an IFC building element proxy. We don't care about it in terms of Kobe at this point. I may, if I get time, talk about how we deal with hazards and risks inside of the project. But um, that's only if I've got time. I've not planned to. So once we've built those, we've done basic 
um, in this case, I guess you'd call it manual or visual checks to make sure things are okay, we go on to the automated checking process. Um, as I've said, we have certain things that are stage-based and if you download the Kobe extension, there are a whole series of Kobe checks that are stage-based. Um, they're a very good example of how that works. Um, we've extended that actually to start looking a little bit more at the IFC and Kobe structures of the file. So for example, if I open this one, one of the checks that wasn't in there is that um, according to um, BS 1192 part four, every floor must have at least one space. So we check that as a standard rule. And building the rules, um, I don't want to go through those in too much detail, but if we just look at this one quickly, all that's doing is checking that um, a floor has got a, a containment that is a space. You go forward, sorry, the other way around, a space, if you go backwards, it's contained by a floor. Um, that is not empty means to say that it has to have a floor behind it or a space in front of it, I should say, to pass the rule. Now, I'm going to run this very quickly because this is only a very small project. It shouldn't take too long to run. There we go. And what you see now is by running this check, just get that back up. Um, this one example that I've been looking at, the floor must have a space, it's actually got an error. And I can check down here and see what is actually going on. If I click on this and open it, it says wrong value. Basically, th th it is empty. Um, there is a floor 01 and a floor 03 that don't have any spaces, which is great because this model was built that way to actually test these rules. In, in all the testing that we do and all the building of rules, one of the most important um, advice I can give is build a test model with at least one case where it fails the rule and at least one case where it passes the rule. That helps you um, analyze very quickly whether your rules are working. It does mean that if you're working in Salibri, you need to have an authoring tool open as well when you're setting things up, but um, that's not, you know, it's not a very difficult thing to do. Um, but that's what we do. This model has got flaws that we know are going to fail so that when we're demoing things and when we're actually going through training, we can show people how they fail. Um, what we can do, in fact, is um, call up this item here, the results summary, which show a summary of there's actually only one that passed. And that's floor two. Oops. Floor two is gone. I apologize. Um, that's this space in here. We know that there's space in here because that's the way we built the model. And there you go, you can see the hazard symbol in there as well. So that's how we build these, uh, these rules up. Um, we try to always name the rules in a way that explains exactly what's going on. So this is quite clear. Floor must always have one space. Um, we come down, we actually start to get into more complex rules here. So as I was talking about earlier, um, we're checking the layers in the file, which are a very good way of classifying things and checking that the classification code, if you're working to something like Uniclass 25, um, all elements are classified correctly, but then elements are on the correct layer. People say if they're using Revit, layers aren't important. Um, th that's true inside of Revit, it's true, but when you look holistically, much other software, um, Archicad, um, open Buildings Designer, they all work with layers and simple things like DWG exports and files, they need layers too. So to us, layers are an essential way of classifying information still. And here's the rule that I was talking about earlier that checks that elements are actually on the right layer. And what that is, is a series of parameters set up to say beams should be on this layer, columns should be on this layer. And if they're not, it flags it up here and tells us that they're not. So that's a quick kind of overview of how we're working. And just quickly to finish off, I just want to go a little bit beyond that. I'm sorry about taking up too much time here. Um, but it's a quick slide actually shows you how we report this. When we're, when we're generating Kobe, how we report it back to the uh, design teams. Not all of them have Salibri. Not all of them, even if they have it, understand how to interpret the results without looking for them or preparing long presentation slides. So what we actually do is we build in a, a, a Kobe report. We export this directly from Salibri and we go back, send this back to the delivery teams and it shows them quite clearly. This item here has not got a parameter defined for the category 
uh, for the type dot category so they can see immediately and in a way that's going to be presented to the client exactly what is right and what is wrong so just being aware of time i'm just going to skip on past how we report things and just talk a little bit about um beyond kobe and we talked earlier that um the british museum are specifying kobe for their fm systems as well well at the moment um they don't um, actually use kobe within their systems but that's not a problem kobe is the standard format that we're working to if we have kobe we can quite easily build mapping tables that take it directly into the fm system for the client and this is one of the, the big benefits of working to consistent data we don't have to specify on a project the specifics that delivery team will have never seen before of the fm system that is proprietary to any um, clients. What we do is tell them to deliver Kobe, hopefully they're getting more familiar with that as time moves on. And then what we do is use an information takeoff inside of Salibri to actually generate the export to be imported into the FM system. So one of the powers and flexibility of making sure that these classifications are correct, we can just then call them up as an information takeoff and use them. And what this does, this one for example, goes through each of the items in the, um, in the asset list and it applies a tag from the FM system. I see there's an example of 8 tube, but I'm using doors here. And basically assigns any component in the IFC file that's a door with a specific classification to become a door in the um, in the ITO, in the classification that will be used in the ITO. Um, that then gets built as an information takeoff. And you can see our, inform in fact, let me just jump back into Salibri for the last minute. Let me take you into that information takeoff live and show you that actually we have this and it matches exactly the, the columns that are used for the import into the FM system. And even though this isn't the right project, I can take this off and we can see every entity that would be imported in the FM system on the screen as a classification. All I then have to do is report that out as a CSV file or an Excel file, and it can be imported directly into the FM tools. That is the benefits of working to co uh, co consistent data. And that's just an example of that. So this is a final example of the British Museum project. Actually, this is what we're talking about for the, um, for the handover. It's a series of spaces, a series of equipment, um, warranty, maintenance data that can then be used inside of the FM system. And that's what we're aiming for at handover. It's not just where things are, it's are they correct? So just to summarize before we hand over the questions, um, you have to make sure that um, you understand what information you require. Clash detection, as I've said, is just one aspect of information management. You have to make sure that your, your, your design criteria is specified um, effectively and that your requirements are quantifiable. Ask questions of quality assurance that can be answered yes, no or ask the question how many so you get a quantifiable definitive result that quality assurance is important that we work to platform neutral we can't be writing this and building this in 15 different design tools we can't restrict design teams to use tools that aren't ideal for their way of working so open data formats it is essential for us in making this work and then one of the other things we try not to generate we don't generate kobe from different information in the IFC. Um, people, for example, working in Revit may actually export the IFC and then generate Kobe from the original Revit model. We never do that. Kobe is always generated directly from the IFC so that we know that the handover information in the open data format IFC physically matches the non-graphical data that's handed over as Kobe. We know the two check together and we don't need additional QA checks to match whether the Kobe data matches the IFC. It is one of the same thing. And as I've said, just to summarize there, flexible mapping, making sure that if we're getting data at different locations from people, we're using the power of Salibri's classifications and ITOs to build them in a consistent location. And then hopefully what you've seen from this, size actually doesn't matter, from going from a single house, the uh, falling water test project that we use, through the, the um, BMARC Research Center, through onto Tideway, 25 kilometers of brand new sewers. It's about consistent asset specification that makes the difference. And if I can just finish with a couple of quotes here, 
we, we from other people far more educated on quality assurance than me um, we must define quality as conformance to specifications if we are to manage it that means we need clear specifications and conformance to those specifications is what we're actually measuring and finally quality control is not what's important quality improvement is what we're actually looking for collaboratively in our case through the project thank you very much i've gone on a little bit longer than i expected but handing over some questions now back to you rena thanks nigel thank you a lot for the great presentation and yes we do have some uh questions coming in here uh firstly uh the first question uh is that uh while fully appreciate that the function of kobe has the potential to be used prior to handover, but have you actually seen this used in practice? Usually the drop is not complete until the end of stage, which is usually too late to be used for the functions described. That was a long one, but <laughs> I hope yeah. you got no, it. No, I, I, understand. I understand the question completely. No, um, that's, that's one of the things we're, we're generally involved with on our projects, is making sure that it's not delivered at the late stage. Yes, generally it is, because generally Kobe or, or the data side of things is secondary to the the design and construction issues that are going on what we're trying to do by this is saying that um, we need to look at when information is being exchanged on a project clearly and make sure throughout the stages which is how when we're involved on a project we're doing we're checking things at mid-stage we're actually looking at it and running conformance checks on the project then and having um as i use the word too many times but collaborative meetings with the design team to say you're expected to deliver this at the end of stage you've actually only got it 40 percent complete at this point which is okay we're about 50 percent through the project but we need to make sure that these fields are completed by the end of it um, it is an effort together to make that data work if it isn't and yes as you say you get to the end of the project um, or the end of the stage it is too late um, we're working with a number of clients at the moment to look at acceptance criteria at the end of stage so that the things aren't just getting ticked off because the, um, the the contract manager has said oh we've got all the information delivered we've got all the drawings we need yes but do we have the data behind that and linking that as part of the quality assurance and um, acceptance criteria on a project that's where we see the big differences in effectiveness coming through hopefully that answers the question thanks nigel um and then maybe just shortly again explain what is Kobe. <laughs> that was the question. Yes. That Sorry, I did say I did say that I was going to explain it slightly. I was going through this. So, Kobe stands for Construction to Operations Building Information Exchange. It's a long way of saying um, it's a a format. 95, 99% of the time, you're going to see as an Excel spreadsheet, and what it does. It takes the um, the information that is in a project, formats it in a consistent spreadsheet way that you can see exactly what equipment is available in the project and where. Now, the way it works, just really briefly, is you have a number of different sheets, and they may be things like spaces, floors, components, types. Um, in the components, that's a list of all the elements on the project. But then there are other columns in Kobe that then link that back. And one of those in the component sheet will be the space. The component is then related to the space. You can go back to identify the space. The space will be linked to the floor sheet. And it's just a way of structuring data so that you can identify things on a project and understand where it is. Um, it was, if you're interested, designed by the uh, United uh, Army Corps of Engineers to, to find a consistent way of delivering their equipment schedules on all of their assets across the uh, the country and the world. Very quick definition of Kobe there. <laughs> Thanks, Nigel. Hope that cleared it out. Um, then there's a question: How is the master data maintained? Um, I'm not quite sure what that means, but if we're talking about um, <laughs> if we're talking about a, a federated model, or we're talking about the the asset information model once it's handed over, there there are a number of different approaches to that so um, in terms of master data we are managing that in these instances um, by federating the models together and checking them um, well let's talk about the, the British Museum project we are responsible for bringing the data together we are we are bringing the, the information that's contained in all the separate models together federating that together and then exporting that out to Kobe um, so it's all in one place if things are being changed 
they are delivered again directly from the delivery team responsible for that and that's all that's all defined in the responsibility matrix who is actually completing that data on the project they will then issue any updates in we'll bring that back into the federated model and we'll export Kobe on and the um, FM tools again from there um, in terms of the asset information model after that's been handed over the master data then becomes part of CAFM system the computer aided facilities management system that is maintained and updated directly in that system then hopefully that's an answer to the question um, if it isn't pop another question in there quickly and we'll try to clarify mm -hmm. it thank you um, then uh, there's a question for you about uh, could you please explain how to switch between clash rules for different stages in the first example you picked Kobe stage three ah yeah okay um, that, that might not be a very cool is the screen still sharing Yes. So, um, let me get my cursor on the screen. Under checking, um, the way that can be done is these rules here are gatekeeper rules, as we call them, rule parameter, um, and that's done through. You saw me on the um, on the to do list actually checking which stage it is. Um, I don't think we've got time to go into this in any more detail than this, but basically, what we've got is a rule that says um, include anything that is being given stage zero. The next one will include anything that's been given stage zero and stage one, stage two and stage one and stage three. So it's com it compiles together. Um, when I choose in the to-do list here, turn the complete one, the Kobe CIC stage, then if I choose four, it loads in these rules that are related to anything stage four and below. That's the way it works. And the way that user input is done, I won't go into it now, but in the rules, manager side of things you can actually specify a certain type of rule that is a user input associate that to a rule set every time that rule set is loaded it will be linked in the to-do list um, so you can see that that rule is actually done before you run the checks um, sorry if that one's a little bit cryptic i don't know whether um laura can um can explain that anymore but um there is a specific way of doing it that you can find out from the uh, actually the sleepy blogs um they go into that kind of thing in a bit more detail. Yeah, I think that was pretty good explanation with the time frame we have at the moment. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both. All right. Then we have a question again for Nigel. Um, in these two projects, uh, was your company the one responsible of defining the project data requirements? Uh, what was your role in the project value chain? Main designer or something else? So we were, we are, we are um, uh, appointed on both these projects as um, client side information manager. I guess that's the best way of describing it in terms that um, particular people in the UK understand. Um, so in, in terms of the, the, the smaller the British Museum project, no, the, the information requirements were already defined on that project when we came involved. Um, our role is to make sure that the teams are delivering against those information requirements. And to be fair, they're a very, very comprehensive and full set of information requirements there. They're actually probably some of the best that I've seen on both these projects, in fact. Um, so our role there is actually to help the design team deliver against the final requirements for the for the client. On the other side, yes, we've been involved in the Tidal one since um, since actually the, the the information requirements you saw there were defined. We we work with the delivery team. We don't write them ourselves on our own. We work with the team um, very closely to help define those. Um, and they've changed a lot over the years. The um, you know with a project that size. Um, we're still there, we're still there now actually looking at um, validation checks on that and how this information works and goes together. So yes, we have been involved on both of those. Thanks, Nigel. Um, as we are running out of time, uh, I'm just gonna, well, firstly, if we don't have time to go all through all the questions now here in the live session, we will definitely get back to you and, and go all of these through after the session. But just checking, Nigel, your uh, schedule, that do you have a few extra minutes or are you uh, no, I'm, uh, I'm in a rush to another? For a few more, yeah. Yeah, let's take a couple more then uh, and go a bit over time. So uh, then there is a question that why is clash detection part of the information management role where when it's uh, excluded from the CIC scope of services for information management? Um, <laughs> yeah, <that's> a... <laughs> um, 
so we don't necessarily work to the CIC scope of information management. We work to the requirements of the client and what their scopes are. So in yeah. terms of the British Museum project, we're not actually dealing with the clash detection at all. That's helped, dealt with by a completely separate company who are involved in the coordination meetings more directly. Our role is kind of above that to make sure that it's being done and that the data is correct. So don't forget the CIC scope of information management services don't also reflect the requirements of information management from ISO 19650 yet. So our scope of services, we've actually rebuilt it in the last year when we're being appointed to these projects to look at the um, ISO 19650 information management responsibilities. And if we're being employed either by the client or by the delivery team or the architect, what responsibilities do they have for delivering this information? And that's how the scope of services is defined. Thank you. Uh, let me just check that I didn't miss anything from here. Yeah, then uh, then there's a question that, have you ever got IFC input which didn't need a manual classification? <laughs> have we ever had one that didn't need it? Yes. <laughs> Actually, we've had some very good um, IFC models come through, but I would say it's not necessarily about the quality of the IFC file that makes the difference. What is important is the data that people require. Um, mm. You know, IFC is just a, a structure, it's a schema. The data inside of that is important and it depends on which tool you're using. If you've ever worked inside of Slebra, you'll know that, that some of the rules are there are demonstrated for, for Archicad import. Um, the same property, if it's generated in a different piece of software, Revit or Open Buildings Designer, may come through in a different place. It's each um, vendor's interpretation of how they implement the IFC requirements that makes the difference. So yes, we've had IFC files that don't need it when we've been working on a project that only use one authoring tool. Um, that's that's the kind of job we uh, we actually always look forward to. Great, thanks. Um, this is, I'm not 100% sure if this is more for you, Nigel, or for us, but I'm gonna ask it. Uh, so how do you classify a component that goes from one space into another? <laughs> I can see that. Um, um, it depends on what the object is in terms of what the way we work. Um, so a door is a great example. A door is classified as belonging to the room from which it opens into but in terms of maintenance is where do you go to fix that so an entity can span multiple spaces if it's maintained from multiple spaces but in terms of kobe deliverable that item should be specified or classified as the room from which it's maintained now in terms of automation about finding the nearest space to answer the question technically that may not be what you get immediately inside of Salibri so what you've got in Salibri is the ability to do a you know um, the, the federation side of things um, federated floors and spaces to actually change which space it's related to so that you get the right results for the exported Kobe sheet hopefully knowing the guy who wrote the question that'll answer his question for him good question thanks thanks there are still a couple of more questions. Let's try to get get uh, these through. So starting from scratch, how much time did it take to develop the rules for, for the two uh, project, for the two scale projects? I don't know if there's work missing. Yeah, okay, no, no, I can I, I get the question for that. Um, mm. Starting from scratch, as in open and completely blank Salibri interface and start from scratch, it's taken a long time. Um, the, the rules actually, if, if you wanted to put it into a, some kind of budgeting or scoping kind of exercise, four or five days. Um, things have been tweaked as they've gone along, but tweaking doesn't take long. Once you've got the structure, um, we use the same structure pretty much on every project. So it now only takes us um, one, two, possibly three or four days to actually prepare something of whichever scope it is. And that's always based on the information requirements for the, from the from the uh, client. Um, once you've got the structure, it can be mapped very easily. And we use, as I said, we use the same structure for every job. So all in all, we're talking days rather than weeks. Thanks. And uh, then when a model, model or its data needs to be updated during uh, um, occupancy, how is that managed? OK, so I think, I think that's very similar to the question that was asked earlier. If it's, if it's updated through occupancy, then that depends really on how the client is managing their asset data. 
Um, if it's a minor change, then it sh should be updated in the FM system. Let's not forget that the purpose of COBE is transfer only from a design um, state, construction state, construction to operations. It's designed as a, as a transfer. It's not designed in a main, as a maintenance format. That will be handled inside of the FM system. But that, again, depends on whether it's major or minor works. If the change is major, then it will go back through to stages 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and actually be be issued again and updated into the asset information model as one as a new update. So plenty of different ways of doing that. Final question. <laughs> How do you arrange for uh, mapping between uh, EIR, IFC and COBE? Um, that is done through our um, responsibility matrix. That is a table that shows which information is required. So we can take the information requirements, we can look at those, and one of the first things we do when we're involved in a project is look at the information requirements and pull out what is going to be needed in the final deliverable. In our responsibility matrix then, we don't just have building entities, you know, uh, partition walls, um, structural columns, services, ducts, we have three columns after that, which list the parameter or property that needs to be filled in to deliver against that in the authoring tool so that the people building the work know what they're looking at. They may not understand IFC or Kobe either, but they have a list of properties or parameters inside the authoring tools that tell them which ones are needed. That is then a matrix that shows which stage that is needed and who is responsible for filling in that data. What we then do is fill in those other two columns. One is which, where does that map from the authoring tool to IFC? And that is handled. We prepare mapping tables for that information on projects typically that will be handed out to the delivery teams to make sure they use that when they're exporting their IFC data so that things end up in the place we're expecting to an IFC. What we then have is the third column is the component, uh, the, the Kobe field that that relates to. Um, if that's not an immediate kind of obvious thing that is dealt with through the uh, Kobe generation inside of Salubri, if it's been customized slightly by the information requirements, we will build um, classifications or independent ITOs as we've done for the health and safety side of things inside of Salubri to get that data mapped to the correct location. So at each stage, you can always look at what information you're expected to receive either in the authoring tool mapped to the IFC through mapping tables that we prepare and then into Kobe and that's mapped onto each stage in the responsibility matrix. It's actually a responsibility matrix that tells you what responsibilities are through the project. It's, it's useful. All right, thanks so much, Nigel. Um, if if there was any question left unanswered, we will definitely go this through after, after the session and, and uh, get back to you um, or update um, those online. So don't worry about that. Uh, yeah, thank you, Nigel, for a great presentation. And uh, to wrap Thanks. things up, um, just quickly, uh, information on the next session we're going to have next year. So Wednesday, 13th January, we will have Robin Kramer uh, presenting uh, a case from the Netherlands. So uh, this uh, a link to this um, to, to register for this session will be sent to your email after after this session. So uh, mark that in your calendars and hope to see you there. Otherwise, um, thanks for everyone attending and uh, happy holidays. Uh, hope you will get some relaxing uh, time off with your families and, and you're staying healthy and safe and uh, yeah. Thank you and see you again next year.